everyone. I'm Jessica Minhas, and welcome to another episode of Work With Me. This week, we're joined with uh, we're joined by Reverend Q English from Bronx Christian Fellowship Church. She and her husband Tim English uh, yes. have been pastoring there for the last six years as co pastors co-pastors. We're mm -hmm. going to hear a little bit about what that's like. And um, also just she's she's a pretty incredible lady. So I'm, I'm excited to chat with you. Thank you so much for, no, thank you for having me. coming to join us. Yeah. We made a little mistake <laughs> in no, our scheduling. Okay. Um, today is actually Good Friday. So um, yeah. we are dressed in black in in reference to yeah. Good Friday. Yeah, and for those of uh, for those of you who are watching and are not quite sure the significance of Good Friday, do you mind sharing just a little bit, I don't really mind quick? At all. What you is know, for us? It's it's when he was crucified, the day of his crucifixion and um, the day of his burial, and as Sunday, as many of us know, that it's also the day of his resurrection. We're talking about uh, Jesus Christ in the Christian the faith. Son, Jesus Christ, Jesus yep. Christ in the Christian faith, the Son of God. Um, and and during, this, during this time that we could call it Holy Week, we remember the journey. We remember the journey, um, the hill to Golgotha, and uh, where he was, uh, where we believe he was um, hung, and he died for us, and died for our sins, and took on the sins of all of humanity, so that we can have a, a right to the tree of life, a right to be redeemed back to God. And we feel that that's what he's done for us. And so this week is very significant in the Christian faith, as we remember that journey. And. Today, the significance of today is really about um, sort of mourning, is that, and like yeah, it's, it's creating actually, space and a, silence? Yes, absolutely. It's when you think about anyone being uh, crucified um, unjustly, and it was for him, it was an injustice, and um, dying and um, being buried, um, we remember that, and he did it for us. And so it is a day of remembering, and sadness but joy comes on Sunday morning, because that's when we remember that. It was that day that he raised, he was risen. I am. Um, I once took a class with Dr. Dan Allender. I don't know if you're familiar with him, mm. but he runs the Seattle School for Theology and Psychology. And I was looking into trauma care. And one thing that he referenced was this idea that even outside of the Christian faith, we can look to Friday, Saturday, and Sunday as a reflection of life here on earth. Mm. Friday being the day that you know, stuff goes wrong in your life, you have this history or this past that might include like abuse, like in my case, abuse. I smile when I say that and I laugh because I've just gotten used to talking about it so much. But, um, and then Sunday mm. can be sort of like the idea that we all have a chance to be redeemed and we all can live a full life and healing. Mm. Mm. But what do we do about Saturday when we're all mostly living in Saturday, when we know of what happened and we know what's yet to come? Mm. How do we bring some sort of sense of joy to Saturday. Mm. I always thought that was such a neat way of thinking, thinking about it, even yeah. if you're not a, not a believer of, yeah. of, of Christianity. Absolutely, and you know, if you want, and even on Saturdays, for those, for those, there's a lot that it's, it's their Sabbath and their holy day yeah. as well, so it's a time of rest. And I don't know, we, I think we need to start thinking more intentionally about where, what is our, yes. where is our Sabbath? Where is our day of rest? Where is our just a time of just reflection and exhaling, you know. Um, I think how that's do you wisdom. Do, how do you do it? Because I know you are yeah. you are a busy, busy woman. Uh, yeah. Earlier before this interview, I was researching you a little bit. Of course, uh -huh. we actually met doing um, anti-trafficking work and advocacy mm -hmm. work together. And I hosted a panel with her, and I was like. She is like my spirit animal. I want to be her when I grow up. I would just want to be her. And yeah. so that's why it was, it's such a treat to have you on the show. But when I was looking through your bio, I was just thinking to myself, like, how does this all happen? I mean, we're going to get to the granule, yeah. like, nitty gritty of what is actually what her week looks like. But actually, you know what? Maybe that's a place to start. What does your week look like? You're a reverend. You know, uh, it is like, I think I'm on steroids or something. I, it is very You're insane. not on steroids. I'm not on steroids. But you're still managing to do all of this. But I'm still managing to do all of it. I don't know. I'm absolutely not on steroids. Yes. And, know. you know, it, I think it just comes with a lot of um, being strategic in how you manage your day and who you surround yourself with and recognizing that, you, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? You, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? You just sort of learn how to live in the moment and don't go crazy if you don't get everything done. But I'm a crazy believer that if I have a dream and I think it and I believe it and I feel it's God given, then that means he's going to give me the wherewithal to fulfill it. 
And that means I'm going to have the resources, I'm going to have the manpower, I'm going to have the volunteers. I'm going to have favor. I'm going to have favor wherever I go because this is something that he's instructed me to do. And nothing I do, is, everything I do is going to point to bettering our world. It's going to point to addressing injustices. I don't live, you know, frivolously, and uh, nor do I. Uh, but I do believe in family time. I do, I do do that. In the midst of everything that I do, I've been married for 35 years to one amazing man, um, and you know, my chill out t t uh, ways of chilling out, believe it or not, is. I love just like watching a movie to the next movie to the next movie because I have to focus and concentrate on the movie. I love movies. I love theater. I love the arts. Um, and I love good food. So I yes. mean, I'm a foodie. I mean, so you give me a fine dining, wonderful, wonderful tasting restaurant, even if it's a little hole in the wall. You know, I love those outlets with family. That's how I sort of create that. Like even last night, even after ministering, you know, we were out at 12 o'clock. It was like, Let's go to the diner and just have one-on-one -on -one time. Even if it was just an hour and a half, having that time, knowing that the next day was going to be back at the wheel, back at the grind. So my day is packed. And sometimes it's 18 hours or so, but I, I thrive off of knowing that it's helping someone or something that we may not see right away, um, Jessica. It may not come to fruition until many, many years from now. But for me, it's about the seed that I plant. The seeds you sow are the seeds you grow. You seeds know? you sow, you need to write, that's like a tweetable. Yeah. The, the seeds, seeds you, you sow are the seeds you grow. So you gotta I, sow the good seeds. You gotta oh, do the good. right thing. You know, with your wow. life, you know, you got to think about what are you, what's your harvest going to be. And yeah, so, and when you say harvest, you're, that is so great because yeah. we, we actually had a few guests um, on before and we like to talk about purpose. And Yeah. Uh, so you're saying that, like, the, the purpose of your life is really about, like, what are you harvesting for others? What are you yeah. leaving behind? What's your yeah. legacy? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. How do you want to be remembered? You know, you always hear about, you know, you have a start date in life, you have an end date, but what really matters is what's happening in between the dash, right? And so just how are you living life from day to day? So you wake up, you're helping humanity by building bridges between this race and that race or this community and that community. You're helping a child with education for their future. You're fighting for living wages. You're fighting for paid sick leaves. You're fighting, you know, to for uh, to raise the age so that our kids won't be in prison at 16 years old with adults. Yes. All of that are yes. things that matter. And these are all things that you're doing. And it's all things that I'm doing. Yeah. And it's all things that I love. You know, I, I love, you know, every year on Martin Luther King Day, I get arrested. And I love it, right? Wait. <laughs> Wait. It's a civil disobedience. And Wait, I love what? it. I get arrested. I get arrested. I like stand in the street. I'm there with 32 BJ the union. I'm fighting for the airport workers because of the crazy, crazy poverty wages they're making. No, seriously. And, oh, it's I didn't horrible. know this. It's horrible. What, horrible, is, what, horrible, is, the, what is the wage? So for right him? now it's the fight for 15, just for the airport workers. Even though to me that's still poverty wages. Yeah. But at least it's better than what they're doing. Some of the tip tippers, I think they were getting like four dollars or something. You know, uh, an hour as a uh, tip wages. I forgot what they're called. They call it. But the bottom line is, you have to fight for those that don't have a voice until that you can empower them to have their own voice. You have and to fight for those who don't have a voice until you can empower them to have a voice. That's right. It's like it's one I'm thing. To, right now, it's one thing down. to give a person a fish, another thing to teach a person how to fish. Right. Right. Because that fish is gone. But if you can teach them how to fish, but sometimes that takes time. But until that time comes, you got to be there with them. You got to stand with them. You got to fight with them. You got to be present with them. They got to know that they have allies and advocates mm. there. So for me, Martin Luther King Day, I thought, where else would he be? He wouldn't be, I mean, I understand, you know, we quote the Martin Luther King poem, we, we, you know, we have our church services and sing songs, and that's wonderful, but my energy in my life comes outside of those four walls, when that church service is over, to step out knowing that I'm going to do something that's purposeful for mankind, and so to so stand in the street with all of the workers and all of the people that are just rallying and, 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 and marching with them and then putting those, those handcuffs and for the Civil Disobedience Act, there is nothing more rewarding to me 
to do that for them on Martin Luther King's birthday. I don't care. I'm going to be arrested every year. I don't know what I'm going to be arrested for <laughs> Martin Luther King's birthday. I'm going to find something to be arrested for because for me, it is a cause worth fighting for, whether it's living wage, you know, for them or the retail workers or McDonald's workers, you know, I'm there for them. And so, yeah, that's my passion. Where does this come from? Because I know you grew up just around the corner. I actually... grew up around the corner. <laughs> I'm so excited that, that I'm right here. Spanish Harlem. 106 in Madison. My mom is still we're there. At, okay, we're at a new studio. We're at a new studio. We're at a new studio. It's 104 and... And third. Lexington. Lexington. Between Lexington and third. You're right. Yeah, Lexington, Lexington and third. And um, yeah, it's called El, El, El Barrio Firehouse. El Barrio. That's me. Spanish I was here with the Ros Capoya and the uh, Bacalajito with the garlic. And I remember buying sugar canes for 25 cents on the corner. That sounds delicious. Oh my gosh. It was the best ever. So this is my heritage, man. And your mom is right around the corner. Right around the corner. 106 in Madison. And uh, she's still there because we can't, you know, even though we said, Mom, we can move you. No, 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 I don't want to move. But she's still there. It's, it's where I lived. And my experiences were so rich. And I got what I got from her and from my godmother. My mother was like, she would take in homeless people off the streets and have them live with her. She would feed even if it was down to her last. My, my godmother was a pastor on 105th between 1st and 2nd Avenue. It was called Whosoever Will Church, Let Him Come. And, it's a and, great and title. it was amazing. And so we would feed people. Every Wednesday, I was in a hospital with her, praying over wow. people. When the AIDS epidemic broke out, we were afraid. We would be there for them. We prayed with them. We gave them food. You know, we took care of the drug addicts. You know, um, I remember waking up in my mother's house and, and thinking, you know, it, it, and this is not a negative, no negative connotation toward the person, but it was like, what does that smell? And it was like, my mother didn't care how they smelled. She would bring them in. We would look outside of our room, and there was somebody on the couch. Ouch. It was who she was. Mm. It was who my godmother was, and it's who I am. And so it's it, it it's not even about you know earthly reward. I'm not even in it for that. I really want to see the change that God wants to see in His people. And um, you know, I think for us as faith leaders, that's who we're supposed to be. It's not about the four walls, Jessica. It's not about the next color. What are we going to paint? What's the chance to leave? When's the next Women's Day? What color are we going to wear? I mean, all those are fine and good. At the end of the day, what are we doing for mankind? You're touching on something that I think is really important right now yeah. in this time of, um, we, you know, we're seeing on the news like all this religious extremism, and mm. there's a lot of scare tactics from some certain politicians who shall may remain Yeah, that unnamed. will incite World War Three. But, um, and I, I, I think there's a, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there's a sense which, with the church that's kind of like, a, oh, they're, they're just like them. They're just like that, mm. us versus them. But mm. you're saying something different. You're saying the church is really not about that. It's really about serving the poor. And I read on your website, you said you guys are very justice oriented regardless of race, um, mm. social or economic status. Mm. Can, what is, it, it just sounds so refreshing to hear. And I'd love for you just to share a little bit about yeah, like, I, For me, it's all about healing, healing. I, the, our theme that we adopted has been healing of the city. Because if you keep that in your purview, then you will not find yourself battling on fronts that God never intended you to battle on. Or you would not find yourself being so combative against what we, we would name perpetrator. Because as a healer, we got to build bridges between victim and perpetrator who sometimes switch places. This is true. You know? This is and true. And so it is so important. How do you do that? Let me tell you. It's being able... If I give the example of building community relations yeah, with yeah, uh, please. police. With the, uh, let's clarify, with the NYPD. With the NYPD. Who are, you know, they're infamous. Yes, the NYPD. Yeah. How do you do this? How, how do you do, you do How do you do this? And, and you kind of think about this. Protest is a four-month lifespan. Okay. What are you going to do after the protest? Mm -hmm. What is the game plan? What is the game plan after you wear certain colors, after you create the die-in, after you bang down the door? You gotta have a game plan. I believe that in order for us to be effective in creating the healing that we all desire to see in our communities, we have to be able to see the ills through one another lens. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means I'm sitting at the table with you from NYPD and you're sitting at the table with me. Now I can come 
with my own set of lens. And if I don't see what you see, then it's going to be, a, the entire conversation is going to be from a defensive posture. Mm. Okay. Because the only thing I'm going to be thinking about is defending what I know. Yeah. And the only thing you're going to be thinking about is defending what you know. Mm -hmm. But if I take your lens and you take my lens, it makes me effect, an effective hearer. Because the most effective means of communication is in our ability to listen. Most effective, effective means you. of communication mm -hmm. is in our ability to listen. These are so great, you guys. And so, you need to be writing these down. And so, <laughs> and so being able to listen to create the change we want to see. Okay. It doesn't mean that we stop protesting, but it does mean that I'm able to protest, but I'm also able to sit down at the table and create the strategies on how to make our city better. That takes favor, yeah. skills, wisdom. How is the NYPD coming to the table? How did they? It is amazing. It has been, believe it or not, it is a good journey right now. It's a very good journey. I mean, journey. did you just walk into their office and say, like, this is the proposal we have? How, did, how do you how start How did this that? whole thing start? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I've always been on the forefront of criminal justice issues. I mean, and, and really quick, like, 14-year-old you, is this what you imagined yourself doing 14 now? 14-year-old me, absolutely not. No. Okay. Let me share this with you. When I was in, um, at, uh, in um, my home, you know, we had crack and... I had addicts, brothers and sisters. My brother died at an early age because there was no cure for wow. HIV AIDS. Wow. And he was a heroin addict. Wow. That, and my building was considered 10029. Just that zip code was considered high as it related to that. I had an amazing family, just had some really hard challenges. And, um, but my mother had this brilliant idea when they came around, there was an opportunity for children to be bused to a school in Cabrini Boulevard outside okay. of the neighborhood, all white school. So I was the first, one of the, among the first cohort of African American, black and brown kids going up there. And so when I was there, I landed obviously in an intellectual gifted children class, IGC class, the entire time I'm there. And there I had, it was my breakthrough. I was called uh, uh, nigga by the Caucasians, mm -hmm. and I was called whitey lover by the blacks. So you didn't really fit in I didn't fit in anywhere. anywhere. Wow. And, and okay. then, you know, so the bullying took place, you know, pretty much ongoingly throughout my years there. And the intense prejudice among the teachers because they had to, too, they, too, had to now get used to us being there and us being intelligent. So you were just, like, inf inculcated on all sides. All sides. I, that's why I wrote the book, Will the Real Me Please Stand Up? It's all about, I you love know, that title. What, what are you talking <laughs> about? It's like knowing who you are even when others don't. We can purchase it, by the way, on Amazon, <laughs> Friends and Yeah, Yeah, you got to actually have to. You can, you can have to. I've totally run out. I got to get reprints. So okay, you get, get reprints. Right. I'll get reprints. I'll get, get reprints. reprints. Will, just, will yeah. the Real Me Please, please stand, stand Up? up. <laughs> it's like knowing who you are even when others don't, right? Because identity, so identity crisis only occurred when you have more than one person defining who you are. I wish I wasn't doing this interview right now. I <laughs> just, just, like, just love to be writing all this down. I'm telling you, it does. And that's how, that's how my life was. Everybody wow. was defining who I was. I was in a major crisis. I had no identity. I was almost schizophrenic in my thinking. I was paranoia. I had sleepless night. I mean, I had to have a major breakthrough in how, this How piece. did that happen? It, well, for me, it happened through my relationship with God. To me, it happened with me taking, because I live by the principle, what you feed grows, what you starve dies. And mm. so those negative behaviors, I had to literally starve them so the good can begin to grow. Wow, okay. And I had to change my thinking in that. You know, there's an amazing scripture in God's word that says, you know, if, if there be any, you know, praise, if there's any goodness, if it's lovely, if it's a good report, if it's true, yeah. these are the things I need you to think on. And so I began to put all my stuff through that test. Like, is this, because I was so damaged in my thinking, I literally had to put my thoughts through that test and realize that's not how I'm supposed to be thinking. What so, got you to that point, though? Because, you know, I, probably people who are watching the audience have yeah, teenagers. Yeah. And maybe they're not Christians or maybe they are going to church, but their youth is like, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how do you, how, or even if you're an adult, I mean, I'm thinking of friends, myself even. Yeah. How do you jump from, like, having that a, a wake-up call to be like, you know what, I need to be reconsidering w w what my identity is and... That's starving out these um, bad habits and thought patterns. That's a good question. Stuff. You know what I think it was for me? It was so draining. 
it was just so draining for me to be fighting my own demons that I had the power to overcome. I had to recognize that sometimes we think it's everybody else, but sometimes the enemy, the greatest enemy, Jessica, could be ourselves. You slay me. You slay me. <laughs> oh wow. I was my greatest yes. enemy. I was my greatest enemy. Yes. I was my greatest critic. I was my heart. I was like, I didn't really need external influences to beat me up. I could do that all by myself. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I had to decide, is this how I really want to live? Is this how I really want to wake up every day with this? When knowing that God's word says that there is really an outlet. So you were already going to your godmother's church yeah. at that point. So was it sort of like in your head, you were like, you know what, I'm going to try this. I'm going to just try reading this and see if it's helpful. And you know what? It took later on in life for me to really start challenging myself. When, when, I would say in my 20s. In your 20s? Yeah. Okay. I, I, like, I just, I, I, you know, because going through school, going through high school, I was a Stuyvesant High School graduate, you know, I went to one yeah. of the best schools in the nation. You know, I, my, my breakthrough came to even venture out outside of the school of, of my block knowing there was more was that special that school I went to that well bus to I won the French award and what did it for me was they took me to a French restaurant I got to order in French I got to you know use the French the utensils and eat amazing food that one experience changed my life exposure wow exposure okay. did it for me and that's why I have a real passion with youth. Yeah. To get them out of where they are and expose them to something new. You actually have a program, right? Um, girls Who Code. G girls Who Code, okay. I got Girls Who Code going, 6th to 12th graders, right in Co-op City. Now I launched one in my house. Wow, so, so you're really about STEM, too. STEM has been a really big conversation big. in the human rights space. Um, yeah. Lots of conversation around, can we get girls educated in STEM, which stands for science, technology, What's the E? It's, it's engineering. Engineering. Math. And math. And they even have A now for the arts, I think. Wow. Isn't it yeah, but to wow. me, that's huge because there are not a lot of girls in that, as you know, in that yeah. whole space. Yeah. And, um, and it's the computer science field, you know, you start out with 100 grand. You know, it's just a good yeah, money. It's, it's and, a good job. But the exposure is what's really what yeah. I'm talking about. It's like that documentary, um, Misrepresentation, she says on there, you can't be what you can't see. Oh, so that's good. How do we get, you know, women seeing the engineers or people of color, even myself, like, uh, you know, Exposure. I never saw, first of all, I never saw an Indian person oh. ever. Wow, <laughs> so, wow, wow. And then I never saw an Indian person in like media too. We're talking, you know, it's like really been yeah. media, uh, medicine, yeah. you know, it's just yeah. been, a, it's just been. Yeah, that it's so my life. It's, it's, it's it's incredible. So the exposure part is the really... exposure and in a whole nother culture, and it made me think there's more to life than, you yeah. know, because I was only in covered projects. I was around the the you know the crackheads. I, I was around just sitting down braiding hair on the benches or playing hoscops with hand drawn chalk drawn numbers, and you know that was life and maybe handball and basketball and but it was that was just it and then you look and then the next generation is still on the same bench yeah and then the next generation is still on the same bench so you're kind of like reaching back behind I'm you reaching. saying like come on come on come yeah. on and i want to do it from a preventative end mm -hmm. as well as intervention you know that's why i have one of the first alternative to arrest programs in the city right that's where the police you know have given me kids that says you know they could go a little south but if you help them out a little bit through your program then maybe i've got zero percent recidivism they all have stayed out of trouble and you know, I have, you know, with those mentoring programs, mentoring with probationers, I have mentoring for at risk. I got mentoring in Castle Hill for and those who are affected with domestic violence. You, you have living, uh, you have a program called Life, Living uh, Freedom Every living Day. Living in Freedom Every Day. We did yeah. that years ago, and that was when we toured. It was Project Life. We toured um, with, uh, you know, with some amazing folks to prisons. And we did a big thing like in Delaware. And it was for those that we knew that were going to be coming out to create, how do you not recidivate? Because we're yeah. known for in and out, in Recidivate, and out, in and what out. does that mean? And that means going in and out of prison. Okay. How do you not repeat the offense? It may not yeah. be the same offense, but how do you not go back into the prison life? And mm -hmm. so we brought on all the ex 
previously incarcerated folks and just begin to speak into their lives and create it like some uh, easy dialogue, you know, in hopes that they would embrace it and, and, and run with it. So that was one of our first introduction, I would say, Project Life. Hadn't, that was a while ago. Um, it started in Delaware. We did it in New Jersey. And um, so now we've taken on more uh, Project 180, taking our kids, uh, creating a turnaround um, at a young age. Yeah. And then my uh, 16 to 24 year olds, they go through our standard mentoring program that we stay on top of them. And then we create peer mentors. So we have the 16 to 24 come back to the 12 to 15. Matter of fact, a new one is starting Saturday. Now he's going to be an apprentice mentor, a mentor in training for those 12 to 15. So that's his way of giving so back. It's very. Um it gives back to it. It's all about giving back. It's yeah. all about giving. It's all about empowering each the, the them individually so that they can power um, each other. So it's that peer mentoring piece because they can learn more that way when it's peer to peer. I um I know that we uh, we actually just have a few more minutes left, but I I wanted to touch on two things, three things. If we can. Okay. Um, I was reading one of your articles and it said you use this phrase called econ uh, economically incarcerated. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I was just curious, like, could you, what does that mean? What's that article? <laughs> you know I was a journalist at oh, one point. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, 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 know I, I dig it up, I dig it up. <laughs> That, oh, I don't even remember the article. It was it's probably something about living wage, was it? Yeah, it was about it living wage. It was about wage. living wage. And what does like, that mean, in, um, economically you, incarcerated? You know, when I think about the fact that there are some, so, many, so many challenges, particularly with black and browns, yeah. becoming free economically yeah. based on the, the opportunities not afforded them mm -hmm. and the preparation not afforded them that has created the incarceration economically yeah and that's what I meant by that you know and that we okay. have a lot to do to break that wall and so what do we do I think some of the answers is like just creating entrepreneurship opportunities for um, our those that are you know those that may not they would land a job that may not be may not fit in the nine to five realm they may have dreams and visions that just need to be birthed and and they need to run with it and mm -hmm. so for me I believe in entrepreneurship you know and I believe in giving people opportunities you know that's why we created the nest program to be able to expand their horizons beyond the nine to five even if they don't become entrepreneurs at least they'll begin to think entrepreneurially Maybe we'll have you back sometime and continue yeah. the conversation because there is a lot more, a lot to, talk more to talk about. Thank you so much, for Thank Rev you. Reverend Q English. Her website, um, q4senate.com. Please check it out. She is running in November. Yeah. September is the primaries and November is my final win. Next time we chat with her, she might be a senator. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jessica. Oh that was great. <laughs> we need like, like another like, hour.